We are, we are all uh, familiar with the expression, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we understand that although very few of us have probably actually seen an iceberg, we have seen the movie Titanic and we know that an iceberg can be pretty impressive, but the amazing thing about an iceberg is as big as it may seem above the water, there's a lot more actually under the water. You probably have noticed that where Jesus goes, he is often healing somebody of a physical disease. And uh, that in and of itself is very impressive. But I would like to suggest today that that is the tip of the iceberg. And that's part of what's going on here when Jesus chooses to heal this woman on the Sabbath. Because when we really understand the kingdom of God, we realize that in many, many ways, when the kingdom of God comes to us, when Christ is present in our lives, our whole lives become part of healing. Healing not only physically, it may show itself in those ways, but healing oftentimes in other places of our lives. And as I was reflecting on this, I realized that in the prayer we pray every single service, which we call the Lord's Prayer, if you stop to look at what Jesus is teaching us to pray for, he's actually teaching us to pray for the very things, the most powerful ways that God heals the world. So for my message this morning, I will we'll look first at this story, but then what I want to do is help us to reflect on what we might call the iceberg under the water, the ones we don't think about so often when we hear healing stories, but the ones that are actually very powerful. Healing is going on all the time in this congregation and in the world. So, just a couple of things about the story to kind of help us understand it. The Sabbath day is, of course, a day in which uh, the Jewish people honored in ways probably that we wouldn't today. It's a holy day for God, but it's also a day for rest. And so they would um, devise some rules that would define what was rest and what was work. Because, you know, you have to live. And so one of the things Jesus pointed out was everybody understood that if you had a donkey or an ox and you've tied them up at the major, you know, they're going to need to have a drink of water on the Sabbath, so it's okay to untie them and lead them over and have some water. And there were a certain number of steps that you could walk if you wanted to follow this. But people were very careful to make sure that you weren't working, and according to some people, to heal somebody would be work. That's the conflict that Jesus runs into. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue and in comes this woman who's bent over and it doesn't say that she approaches Jesus, but we might imagine that she wanted to be healed because if you were a woman in that society with that ailment, the chances are you were not married, did not have children, you probably were seen as perhaps having sinned and that's the reason it happened to you or maybe your parents did. And so you're kind of on the edges of society. Life is hard. Jesus spies her and right away responds to her need. In other words, Jesus is saying, um, I'm not going to quibble about whether it's okay for me to work on the Sabbath by healing her. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make the point that the Sabbath is a perfect day to heal her. So he goes ahead and heals. You get the response. He says, you hypocrites, 
you'd untie your donkey and ox to take him for water. Here's a daughter of Abraham, which is really saying, here's a person that is in the people of God of, of great value. Why wouldn't she be healed on the Sabbath? And what Jesus is doing is he's saying, the Sabbath has more meaning than you realize, folks. I just want to say one thing about that before we get into the Lord's Prayer. The Sabbath, by honoring God and by giving rest to human beings and animals and even slaves, is saying this. We are more than work machines. We are more than commodities. There's more to life than survival. We're the people of God. We are loved by God. And even the poor are commanded to rest. The slaves are commanded to rest so that people can enjoy the fact that there's more to life. That's the discipline of the Sabbath. Okay. Now, I want to use the, the Lord's Prayer to speak of these things that Jesus actually puts in his prayer about the kingdom of God that have to do with healing. We start out by saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. And then we pray for bread. After that come three things. The first is, forgive us our sins. The second, as we forgive those who sin against us. The third, deliver us from evil. I'd like to suggest that this is the iceberg underneath the surface. It has a lot to do with the healing of the world. Forgive us our sin. It starts with us. You remember in Lord of the Rings, Frodo has to carry the ring that eventually must be thrown into the fire to destroy it because it has great powers and those that have it as they grab for the power are corrupted. But it's even hard to carry it. And remember the last scene of the third movie in which Gollum, who wants that and has been corrupted, and Frodo, who's willing to throw it away, even he is having a hard time letting go of that ring to have it destroyed. When the Bible describes our human sin, it describes within each one of us something that both corrupts us and that we want to hang on to. And so when Jesus is coming and speaking to us of letting go of our sin and of being forgiven because there's not a person here that doesn't regret something about their lives that this power did to them, Jesus is giving love and forgiveness and asking us to let go and in the letting go and letting the love of God fill our lives, we become healed of things that are very destructive in our lives. In other words, to live in forgiveness and the grace of God is going to create a more healthy existence for each one of us. And you'll notice that the Christian faith starts there. It starts with us, each one of us. So when Jesus says, forgive us our sins, he's really saying to us, God will graciously accept the person with a penitent heart. He will not despise it. 
And if we have to look at some things that are painful, it's the difference between a switchblade and a scalpel in the hands of a surgeon. For God, it's the scalpel that will help us to look at the painful things. It will not destroy us. It will heal us. Hang on to the sin, and it's like a switchblade. It eventually kills us. Follow the analogy. But the second thing, and this doesn't get said so often, but I, I want to say it and just picture it. Imagine that you're a little four-year-old and both your parents are on meth and they're pretty far gone. Try to imagine what it's like to be a little kid with your needs surviving in that situation. Picture the scars, the toxicity in the roots of your life. You grow up not being able to do very well in the world. Is that your fault? It's not your fault. You were sinned against. That's an extreme situation, but here's the thing. All of us, in addition to sinning, have been sinned against. And for some, that's a very powerful sinning that has crippled us, and we may spend the rest of our lives trying to work out of that. And so Jesus says the second thing besides forgive us our sins, he invites us to do something that's counterintuitive, and that is to eventually be able to come to the point where we forgive those who have sinned against us. Why is that so important? Because if we carry the resentment and the hatred about those that have done us wrong, in the words of Anne Lamont, it's like drinking rat poison and expecting the rat poison you've drunk to kill that rat. All it does is it destroys you. Perhaps that's one of the most difficult things, but it breaks the cycle of sin and retribution and hatred and instead invites in the love and the presence of God. So a second way that God begins to heal us on the inside is not only when our own sins are forgiven, but in the forgiving, the capacity to forgive those who have sinned against us. And you see what that does right away. It begins to break down the barriers that separate human beings in their sin. You know that story of Adam and Eve when they sin and the first thing they do is they hide and then they need to put clothes on and that's really a symbol of the shame and the distance that happens between people. What God does in bringing us together is that he creates a community that instead of hurting each other begins to learn how to heal and help each other so that when you have a bunch of forgiven and forgiving people living together in a community they begin to be empowered to be healing agents in the world not people that are working out their own pain on others. As we forgive others who have sinned against us. But then there's one more thing, and this actually relates a bit to Pastor Julie's sermon last week. Deliver us from evil. Evil is a presence in the world, and one of the ways you can spot it is by what happens when you are vulnerable and in need and what it wants to do with your vulnerability. If somebody's vulnerable, 
and you have a sociopath, they'll use your vulnerability and exploit it to their advantage. If a broken and contrite heart comes before evil, they will not experience forgiveness and healing. They will be mocked and used. Evil doesn't care about the human being. God does. And often in life, when we seek to do that which is good, and we reach out to those who are vulnerable, we will bump into evil where evil seems to be benefiting from using people. I think about Oscar Romero, the bishop of El Salvador in the 1980s, who was, he was made bishop primarily because everybody thought he probably wouldn't make any waves, but he, he began to get to know some poor people and he began to speak out for their plight because poor people in El Salvador live in just absolute squalor while those that rule the society are incredibly wealthy, but they don't want any changes. So when he began to speak out about some of the needs of the poor, he made enemies right away, and he is the kind of patron saint of El Salvador right now because as he was saying, the words of institution over communion, an assassin put a bullet through his heart to silence him. That's evil. When Pastor Julie said sometimes to stand up for Christ causes division, it's not because Christ is asking us to be difficult people. But Christ is asking us as forgiven and forgiving people to be part of healing in the world. And sometimes to be healing in the world and to seek to be just runs right into those who don't care about being just. They want to be unjust because they're only able to think of their advantage. And that does cause division. Think about it. The prayer that Jesus taught us is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. That's what Jesus is calling for us. So, when the woman is healed of her malady and can stand up straight physically. That is like the tip of the iceberg. And all through our lives as the church, as Christians, when we are confessing our sins, owning our own difficulties, learning how to forgive others, and standing up for that which is good, we are becoming part of a powerful healing force in this world. No wonder Jesus thought that the Sabbath was a splendid day to heal this woman. Amen.